So I take off the bolts, pull off the cover, I look in the gearbox, and sure enough, it's just a bunch of big, shiny brass gears sitting in a bath of oil. I siphon down the oil, and I look down inside, and I'm moving the lever, and after about an hour, I figure out where the gear is. And after about another couple of hours, I manufacture a little wedging tool, a little crowbar that can fit right inside this space and get to the bottom of that gear and hammer it back into place. And lo, an hour later, I've got this gearbox working again. And this feels amazing. Like, the, every bit of terror at the beginning of looking inside that gearbox is now replaced by pride at having fixed it. Oh, by the way, this, the second I looked into the gearbox, what I really looked into was um, a meat grinder. <laughs> like a big one by two foot space with just huge gear teeth sticking out. So I went over and I didn't just turn off the machine. I didn't just unplug the machine. I actually did the thing I do, which is I unplugged it and taped the plug where I could see it. <laughs> I don't think that anyone's going to come and unplug it in, but I am making sure that can't happen. Especially when my hands are buried in oil in the gear train. So once I got it fixed, I filled it back full of oil. I put the cover back on, and then I'm looking at the lathe, and I'm like, man, it's a nice machine now. I'm going to take good care of this. Actually, you know what? I should take good care of it. I should clean. I should clean it within an inch of its life. So, I plug it back in. I start it up. I spray it down with WD-40, and I'm using steel wool and scotch brite, and bringing it back to a lovely luster. And I'm running a, 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 a rag along one of the lead screws as it's running. This is the stupidest thing I have ever done in my life. Because back towards the end, there's a little nubbin sticking out of the lead screw where it attaches to its drive thing. And it grabbed my rag and then my finger and pulled my hand slowly into between two, uh, uh, two separate spinning things. Um, and I yanked my hand back out of the machine and before I looked at it, I wasn't sure I was going to see a finger. I did see a finger, but what I saw was a finger that looked like, I know some of you know the story, it looked like someone had just put a zipper up the middle of my middle finger and opened it up. Um, I do not have pictures. Oh, don't get me wrong, I do have pictures, I'm just not going to show them to you. I have this whole folder on my computer called Entry. <laughs> and it's a horror show. I have, I have one of my sons, Thing One, is actually a cook. And he knows, he sends me pictures of each one of his kitchen entries. <laughs> actually, in his second year cooking in San Francisco, and he calls me on a Friday night at 8, and he's like, Dad, I just cut the crap out of my thumb, and I'm in the middle of a Friday service. If I meet you at the cave, can you sew me up? <laughs> and I'm like, my boy! Yes, come to the cave! I did not sew him back up. Butterfly closures turned out to be sufficient. But so, here I am. I've, my finger's been unzipped, and what I can see is all of my knuckles and the parts that make my finger work exposed to me. And it's March, like, 21st, 2020. Oh, excuse me, all the hospitals, <laughs> funnily enough, hospital and hotel have the same route. Um, seriously, uh, uh, in French, hospital is a hotel of God. Yeah, wait, no, I love that. Anyway, um, all of the hospitals in San Francisco are at capacity. They don't want to see my dumb ass with my finger while people are on respirators. They are going to give me the, oh man, I'm going to ruin their day and they're going to make sure they ruin mine. So I did not want to go. Um, I'm in my cave and I've got this injury. Oh, right, there's this other thing that happens when I get injured, specifically in my hands. Um, I have been injured in plenty of places in my body, but specifically when I injure my hands with a stitch-worthy cut, I faint. Yeah, I have this reaction. I think it's, I suspect that it is because my hands are my primary mode of interacting with the world. My eyes aren't so good. My ears aren't so good. I wear hearing aids. Um, uh, my smell, sense of smell is fantastic, but that's not necessarily a bonus. <laughs> um, and so, I, I mean, but 
years ago I was like working on my interim Blade Runner pistol in my sh in my house at like one in the morning. I was thinking, oh, I'll just peel this little bit of glue off, and my knife slipped and went right through my thumb. And my boys were two years old at the time, and they're sleeping, and I I can't go to the hospital. I'm alone. I was a single dad. I called up my friend Jason, and I was like, could you come over and watch the kids while I take myself to the hospital? He's like, yes. So I go out to my front stoop and I wait for him, and Jason comes in. And as he comes in and we're walking back into my house, I find myself wondering why Jason is walking on the ceiling. And it's because I've passed out and I'm looking at him like this. Yeah. So as soon as I cut my finger, I became really scared that I was just going to fall down. And I don't know, bleed out. I'm terrified. Um, my wife is a marriage and family therapist. I knew she was in session with clients uh, remotely. But we had just managed to bring my mom out. So my mom came out at the very beginning of lockdown and sequestered with us for five months, which was great and also brought me to the edge of my sin. <laughs> and I'm not... Yeah, okay. Um, so, I cut my finger, so I called my mommy. <laughs> I called mom and I was like, hey, can you come over to the sound for a second? Trying to sound really casual. She's like, what's wrong? I'm like, just come on over. And she comes over. I did not faint. I, actually, so as soon as I called her, I sat down, in, uh, sat down in a chair with the first aid kit here and just started irrigating it. And we managed to cobble it back together. That was my water. We managed to tape it back together with butterfly closures. Um, and it's fully functional. It works. I have no loss of any uh, nerve, nerve, I have no nerve damage or anything. It's amazing, except that it's a little bit thicker because I think I reassembled it slightly wrong. <laughs> like my, I'm like Greg Brady. There's like a few nuts and bolts left. I'm like, we didn't need those. <laughs> Um, speaking of terrible, speaking of strange things I have done to my left arm, um, I, I wanted to talk about my tattoo for a second because I have a, a, a six-inch ruler tattooed on my left arm, and I get asked a lot, how useful is it? And the answer is, I use it every single day, and not just from buying, buying plumbing parts at the hardware store. Um, it is separated into inches and centimeters, and the centimeters are further divided, so I have a whole bunch of five millimeter squares. And in terms of how accurate it is, I was confronted with a piece of plastic in my shop a few weeks ago. And I knew, because I had bought all this plastic a few weeks before, that this piece of styrene was either 40 thousandths of an inch thick or 60 thousandths of an inch thick. It could only be one of those two dimensions, because those are the only two I had purchased. How was I going to figure out which one it was? Because in the abstract, it wasn't really clear to me. And then I thought, wait a minute, 40 thousandths? 40 thousandths is a millimeter. Okay, so in one of these five millimeter squares, I should be able to hold it up, and if it is 40 thou, I should be able to divide five of those into the square. And I couldn't, so I knew it was 60 thousandths. Therefore, I say my arm tattoo is accurate to within 20 thousandths of an inch. <laughs> lovely to be back out at the cons and seeing people and specifically seeing you all in costume. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming out and dressing up and representing, letting your freak flag fly. It is sitting at the autograph table these past, yeah, has been just so lovely. I love the stories you share with me. I love the tales. I love, specifically, you know what I, one of the things I love is noticing people when they don't realize they're being watched and they're uncomfortable in their costume because almost all costumes are really uncomfortable and some of them are spectacularly so. And there's just, I don't know, whenever I see like a Ray who's like, whose costume is hitching and they're like, God damn it. I just like, I feel so simpatico with that, right? Like the pain and the, the exhaustion is all part of the experience. Um, so uh, we proceeded on Tested to not only uh, cut the videos that I was making on my phone, but we ended up 2020 having our best year ever by a factor of two. Uh, we were totally astounded. We had no idea how much resonance these, these videos we were making would have, and we're super gratified. Um, and round about 
to be fair, the summer of 2020, the late summer, I was starting to get uh, tired of the tired of coming up with things I could do in a day. I love one day builds, but there's also like I want to sink my teeth into stuff. There's no way you could make a and almost any single part of like a full Mandalorian costume in a single day. Yes, you can make some tiny part of it, but like I'm not going to complete these big projects in some short period of time. So after about five solid months of burning through stuff, um, I was feeling a little stagnated. And then the summer of 2020 hit, and the summer of 2020 sucked. Um, for me, the summer 2020 sucked really bad. Uh, I have never lost anyone close to me. I've been very lucky. Uh, I mean, my dad passed away in 99, but that, that's been it for me. Um, until last summer when Grant O'Hara passed. Um, yeah. That was really tough. And what you don't know is that at the same time, uh, my friend Michael Hawley also passed about two weeks before, and about a week after, um, my showrunner for Savage Builds and Busters Jr., Don Tessier, dropped dead. Uh, so I lost three friends in a month. Um, and I took, a, I think I took a couple of weeks off to just sort of reconvene and, and sort of think about what I wanted to do. And I couldn't, like, there was nothing I wanted to build. There was nothing that I, like, needed to build. <laughs> it felt like for a while. Uh, and then, and then, I realized I wanted to build something bigger. I wanted to sink my teeth into something. And I wanted to step into a, an unknown. That was, that was when I started working on Hellboy Samara. Um, so, uh, uh, many years ago, I got, uh, I, for the first time, visited Guillermo del Toro at Leak House. This incredible museum of, of curiosities. And I held one of the original Samaritans that was built by Weta Workshop for Hellboy. And it's a magnificent piece of work. And I had always wanted one, but I am not a good enough machinist. I was not a good enough machinist to make one. Um, and so I decided to embark on, on doing that, even though I didn't think that I possessed the skills to fully carry the cross. This is the project that I can learn on. And by the way, let me tell you, I'm never going to be a machinist. I have machine tools, and I, I believe I am now a competent machine operator, but I have met machinists, and I am not one of them. Um, but spending that time, spending that time diving in, I spent a month, I spent 140 hours over about five weeks, um, slowly machining every single part of the Samaritan from scratch. I'm sure there's more than a couple of gunsmiths in the audience just because it's Texas. And one of the things that I had written, one of the things I'd said in one of the videos is, man, every single screw on this thing is custom. And every gunsmith was like, yep, that's how that works. <laughs> yeah, Steve nodding heads all over. The best part of making a joke like there's a lot of gunsmiths in the audience because it's Texas to see how many heads nodded. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, so this is the other thing that's really interesting about, about the making of things, about the, for my journey of the making of things, is you step into something like, okay, now I'm going to build Hellboy Samaritan. I'm going to figure out what I need to do, and I'm like emailing machinists that I know and love. My friend Victor Broadley helped me out tremendously. This old Tony uh, gave me huge amounts of advice about chasing the zeros, as machinists call it. Um, and I really, really got really, really found real solace in refining my brain's ability to think in smaller and smaller increments. Because that's what real machining and real engineering really is. It's just being able to picture things on a smaller and smaller level at a finer granularity. Uh, and I finished the Samaritan and I thought, this is just going to be awesome. When I have this, I'm going to have the, I'm going to have the Hellboy Snyder of my dreams. And I finished it and I have it and it's magnificent. And I realized as soon as I saw it done, that I needed another one. <laughs> you never know where your point of view is going to show up. And in this case, as soon as I saw it out of aluminum, which felt exactly like the one I'd held in Guillermo's place, I realized, oh man, I really want one of these in steel. <laughs> and I want to make the actual bullets, and I want to make them fire. Just come on, of course! And the thing about this is, the bullets are so huge, and the amount of power
software you can fit in them is so relatively not ideal that I feel like the actual thing when it fires is going to be like this. <laughs> but there's only one way to find out. <laughs> um, yeah, I think those are my COVID stories for now. Uh, I would love to take some questions from you all. There is a microphone over here in the corner. Line up in an ordered fashion, if you would. I'm not going to get to everybody, but oh, great! And I'm supposed to. Stop. Well, I'll just stop when they pull me off the stage. <laughs> Hello there. I just want to know: Is water wet? <laughs> Am I stepping into like a Reddit thread here? Fifty duck-sized horses. Do you know we tried to do that on MythBusters? We actually we're gonna we're actually gonna bring in Weta Workshop to use their massive software to make 50 duck-sized horses and battle them against 50 horse-sized ducks. Is water wet? I don't I don't. You're recording the answer. I. I is a relationship. Wetness is a relationship between a surface and a substance. You've only asked me about water. That's only a substance. You haven't defined anything else in the equation. Therefore, water cannot be wet because it is only itself.
appreciate your writing the question. Thanks for some excellent rhetorical uh, verbiage. Appreciate it. <laughs> So I will spend a few weeks uh, refining it, sharpening it, grinding it, and making all the jewelry for it. Um, so there's been a bunch of sword thoughts in my head. My sword rack, which I built a couple of years ago and hung in the office of my house, is now way overloaded with all of my favorite swords because I, I haven't built another rack to house. So there's like three swords on every tier. <laughs> yeah, it's all swords right now in my head. Thank you. When you were in one workshop, how much stuff did you steal from them? <laughs> Nothing! I don't steal! <laughs> I appropriate. <laughs> um, actually, you have to be careful at what a workshop when you're walking around with Richard Taylor because if you say you like something, he'll be like, Really? If someone built it for you! <laughs> and you don't want to do that. That feels like, it feels like when you go, I'm a little hungry and someone makes you a full dinner and you're like, oh. <laughs> so, okay, next question. Thank you for being like my Bill Nye in life to the millennials and everything because you really helped me um, find out that I'm a geek, like major. And I've been watching you since I was like two or three. And so I grew up with the show. And my question is if you could do any other project with the Mythbusters Junior team, what would you do and why? Oh! Um, I, one of the things that I pitched for Mythbusters Jr. that I really wanted to do was the most epic Nerf battle imaginable. I was like, could you get Nerf guns to fire like a half mile? And we contacted Nerf and they were like, that is not a question we're interested in. But I loved the, I, I loved the idea of a safe battle at a great distance. Um, they are fierce competitors, my, my co-hosts on the Busters Jr. Um, I, I, that was a really, really, really fun show to make. I love those guys. Uh, I will tell you, we had this wonderful producing axiom for that show. And uh, again, the late John Tessier, the showrunner on it, was a genius. And John just said, at the beginning of production, because we had to film it over the summer because these kids are all in school. If we can give these kids the best summer ever while we're filming, we'll get a great show out of it. Aww. And that's what we did. Alright, I think that's my I think that's the totality of my answer. Thank you. Next question. Hi. I'm uh, Adrian Kovacs. 
and I just have to go. I just have to say I'm a huge fan of yours. Like, I've been watching Mythbusters ever since I was like four years old. Like, so fascinated by the fact that like, I do reverse engineering all the time. Whenever I get something, my first thing that I do is like, huh, I wonder how it works. So I always love taking things apart. So one question I always had about Mythbusters was like, how much of it was actually scripted and how much of it was unscripted? Well, besides the swearing, I know that's unscripted. <laughs> Um, well, scripted versus unscripted is a good question, um, because it's, the answer is kind of neither. Uh, the way we worked that show is that we would think of an experiment. Um, let me, let's give an example. Oh, right, okay. Figuring out that the, that the tip of a whip breaks the speed of sound. Uh, in order to answer that, we were going to need to be able to crack a whip, uh, we're going to need to be able to film it on a high-speed camera. We're going to need to figure out how to film in close-up the tip on a high-speed camera. So we set up a grid on the back wall. So that's the first thing. It's like the experimental methodology is absolutely the driver of everything. So for that sequence, I came up with this idea of making a grid on a wall and cracking a whip in front of the grid until we could see that there was roughly a consistent area in which the tip of the whip cracked. Then we could start bringing the high-speed camera in closer and closer until we actually got that, that breaking the speed of sound on camera. It took about a day and a half. So as we're doing this experiment, so then we go downstairs to go do this. And what we grab then on camera is, uh, both Jamie and I stand in front of the camera and we talk about, okay, there's the description of the methodology, there's the description of what we think is going to happen at the beginning, and what we expect the results to be. Then as we go through, the we do the first test, then we assess how did that first test go. Each of us answers these questions. How did it go? How did it change our expectations? What do we think is going to happen next? Then we do a few more iterations. If something cool happens, we just start filming it. If, you know, we accidentally hit a cameraman in an angle and he gets a little bruised, that's going to be part of the show. Uh, it didn't actually happen, but that sort of thing happened all the time. Um, and we would outline this, right? So we'd send discovery and outline this. Okay, we're going to build this grid, we're going to do this thing, we're going to talk in these ways about how it's going to happen. And frequently, discovery would come back and be like, we need some wrinkle before the third commercial break. And we're like, we're going to mess something up. It'll go into the edit. And it always did. So when I say scripted, we were scripted in that we knew how to talk about each story as we were going through it. We knew which beats. Um, you talk before, you talk in the middle, you talk at the end, and in each case you say what you thought was going to happen, what you think is going to happen, how that changed your expectations, how excited you are, how stupid you actually were, uh, and then you move on to the next one. The, the best thing, and most reality shows aren't made this way. Most reality shows actually at this point have, I swear to God, table reads. I'm not kidding. Somebody writes down at the beginning of the day what's going to happen in that reality show, and then everyone just films it like a movie. Um, on Mythbusters, we were incredibly lucky in that Discovery would really let us follow our noses. So when Carrie, Tori, Grant, Jamie, or I came to a result we didn't expect, we frequently built uh, the surprise. We always built the surprise into the episode. Uh, and in that, you know, the narratives we got to tell were true narratives. Uh, so it was scripted in that we understood the structure, but it was unscripted in that no one ever, there was never time to write down what someone was going to say. Um, I will also tell you that Heinemann, Heinemann has this really weird quality as a performer in which his 50th take is the most naturalistic and like easily delivered thing. That guy, his first take is really stilted, and it's, he's trying to wrap his head around the material and kind of make sure that, you know, he's servicing the next sequence that's going to happen. But then uh, he just repeated takes. By the 50th take, he seems like he just woke up and he's like, hmm, this is right off the top of my head. I've never met another person who gets better and better and better and better with the successive takes. It's super annoying. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, Adam. Um, I want to tell you, uh, I work in local politics here in Texas, and one of the ways that your work has made a massive difference in that world here in the years that I did is the blindfold walking bit that you all tested way back then. Oh, wow! Because it, it dawned on me about, this, I've been in this business about six years, and about a month into dealing with people in politics every day, it dawned on me and several other folks that, hey, this, 
these people are doing exactly what you were doing in Blind Book 1. No information coming in, you're not listening to each other, you're not talking to each other, you're dark foresting, as the young humans say, right? And when you're not communicating, when you're not listening, when you're not talking, you're going off in a direction that you think you're going in a straight line, right? You, you think you know exactly what's happening and your brain is telling you you have 100% of the information you need. And you're lost as that. And that has made a massive difference. Seeing people in that light as they are filling in gaps that are, that are not there yet. And trying to fill them rather than going after or attacking or trying to destroy things has made a massive difference. And you may not see it in the news or other things, but in the state and local levels, that is starting to make a difference. And I want to thank you for that. And you can just hear if you had anything on like your when you experienced it, so what was that like? I'm, uh, what was it like walking in circles? Um, what, what was really funny about walking in circles is that for my very first test of just walking blindfolded in the woods to see if I walked in circles, they gave me a park ranger to follow me, and we got lost. <laughs> we got lost, and it took us about 80 minutes to find the location again. And as we were walking, we saw a bear, which is freaking terrifying. I really appreciate what you say about that. I wanted to talk about science for a second uh, and the world because um, while we are having a difficult moment, <laughs> um, I will say I have noticed something positive. And the positive thing that I have noticed is that there are news articles now that say things like a booster for a Moderna vaccine might help, but we only have a few hundred data sets, and so we can't say for sure. A headline in an American newspaper will say that, and that is a net increase in our whole country's scientific literacy that we can hold that in our brains. Because back during Bush v. Gore in 2000, when we're counting a different, like millions of votes in Florida coming down to a difference of a few dozen votes, that number, a few dozen, isn't actually even a number. To a statistician or a mathematician, that number is too small to matter. Shark researchers don't research shark attacks because they statistically don't happen. There's like three a year. That number is way below a threshold for study. And the fact that we can as a country now hold in our head that more data means more information it feels like one of the positive silver linings in this weird shit show we're going through right now. Um, and I recognize that this is a somewhat self-selected group of science enthusiasts, if you're here listening to me. Um, but I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, I, I, I just want to say, we got to listen to each other. And, you know, listening to each other and hearing our experiences and really trying to overlap the fact that most of us are here to protect our children and our families and our friends and our communities. And then there are a few bad actors that are not doing that. That's, you know, I don't know how we get out of this moment. And I'm scared to death. I really am. Um, but I come to places like this and I hear your stories and I see your beautiful costumes and your lovely faces and I feel real hope. Um, because I feel like we're sharing stories with each other. Because we are. Um, we're sharing we're sharing these weird inner parts of ourselves that other other parts of our life might not accept. Um, that is weird. We're letting our freak flags fly. And this is like an essential human endeavor, and it's really important that we do it. Um, okay, next question. Hi. I Mike. love your thing, by the way. It's beautiful. Thanks. Um, my sisters and I homeschooled them. That was a big part of our curriculum growing up. So what was one myth that may have never aired that was your favorite? Oh, so I do have a... Uh, everything we ever shot made it to air explained except for one thing. Yeah, Tori, Carrie, and Grant uh, were testing some explosive materials. Some easily accessible chemicals. <laughs> that were so energetic in their combination that we destroyed the footage. Um, and it's not like we discovered something new. Every bomb squad knows what we figured out. They're just really glad we're not telling anybody about it. 
Um, however, I do have a favorite myth that never got made, which is the final season as we're like going through what is the last things we can do. The Discovery let us make a whole final season, uh, like a love letter to the fans. Um, and I had this myth I wanted to do. It's an old, apparently American Indian hunting technique, which is if you want to get ducks for dinner, find a duck pond and throw some pumpkins in it. The pumpkins float around and the ducks get used to the pumpkins. After a couple of days, the pumpkins and the ducks coexisting, the hunter takes a pumpkin, puts two eye holes in it, puts it over his head, and swims out to the ducks, who pay no attention to him because they're used to pumpkins. And apparently, you can just reach out and grab a duck. Now, a friend of mine who's a hunter told me, oh yeah, that totally works, he says. And this friend of mine literally does talk like Bill Murray from Caddyshack. He says, yeah, I can get up right to them. You can grab their feet, pull them down, and the duck next to them won't even notice. <laughs> of course we were not going to do that on television, that part. But we, we went way down the path of doing this. We had a duck pond. It was the place that Jamie and I were trying to run on water with those dumb sneakers. Um, and we ended up with a story that had that had so many screw-ups, we accidentally ended up with like 12 extra minutes of screen time in the story. I can't remember which story it was, but it meant that we had to give up a short segment. And we had to give up my duck hunting extravaganza. And I had even gone to the trouble of making a remote control pumpkin-shaped camera. <laughs> that I could steer over to catch all the action. Oh, I'm really sad we didn't do that. Uh, I, I said to a couple of you yesterday while I was signing, I was going to tell a couple of... Am I still good? Do I have... What? You want me to finish it? Five? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's take one more question. We don't have one. Oh. Hi again. Hello. Hello. Absolutely, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and for your pumpkin thing, you could do it on Mythbusters Jr. or on Tested. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll notice the lack of location shoots on Tested, and it's because location shoots are stupid expensive. Every time you leave a building with a camera crew, um, the costs get exponential, especially with permits and all of that stuff. Um, oh, I did want to tell you one last thing, which was uh, a, 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 a lovely a lovely thing. I, I know that, because a lot of you have said this in the autograph line, that my TED talk, uh, a love letter to cosplay, meant a lot to you. Uh, and I, I have one story to tell you about giving that TED talk. Um, and giving a TED talk is every bit as heady and intense as you could possibly imagine. Yeah, I'm making jokes about how shitty the Jaws Halloween costumes were in 1977, and Steven Spielberg is sitting right here laughing hysterically. <laughs> Thank God. Um, but at the, at, and, and that talk was not one which I had planned to give. I had actually given, I had actually written another talk. The ten people had listened to it and told me in the nicest way possible that my talk was bad, <laughs> and they were right. It was, it was coming from the wrong place, and it was not. It was not, as they would say, an idea worth sharing. Uh, and so my wife and I ended up writing a love letter to cosplay together remotely from Vancouver to San Francisco, running through about 60 or 70 drafts in three days. Uh, we had a practice in which we were writing for a couple of hours in the morning. I would think about it, we'd reconvene in the evening, we'd write for another couple of hours, and then I'd record what we had, and I'd listen to it the next morning. And I do, that's a, that's a technique I reserve for talks I want to memorize until I forget them. Uh, and I did. I managed to memorize that one until the words felt like surprises coming out of my mouth on stage. It was a really remarkable experience. And at the end of it, I came off stage and I'm, you know, I, you never know how something's going to land. You have no idea what kind of resonance it's going to have. But I will tell you that a, a, a giant movie star came up to me about an hour after my talk. And I won't name them, but they are a personal hero. And they came over and they grabbed my hand in their big manly hand. <laughs> 
and they said, uh, I gotta tell you, you really floored me today because I've never understood fan culture. I've never, it's always creeped me out, I've never, it's never made sense to me, I've never wanted to be near it, I've just wanted to do my craft and not have to pay attention to all this other stuff. And yet, they said, your talk made me get it in a way I had never gotten it. Uh, and now I understand it and I want to thank you for opening my eyes. I will tell you that my regular practice of cosplay and coming to these cons and signing and photographing and exulting and costuming, cosplaying, uh, has opened my eyes and I wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't for you guys. So I want to finish by thanking you for allowing me to do this. Um, love you guys. Thanks so much. I'll see you out there.